basically, I think, if anything, the commodity picture is going to drive the macro picture even more than interest rates. Because if you look for the next 10-year outlook, I think we have a, a shortage of commodities in general, uh, energy, but also metals, uh, and potentially agricultural products as well as a result. And as such, I think that will put a cap on the kind of economic growth we'll be able to have and potential for large recessions along the way. So do you think, I, I think of this increase in commodity prices because it lags, because wage growth doesn't increase as much and nor do corporate profits. So it's a tightening of financial conditions. Yeah, it is. It's going to be harder, yeah, for sure. That makes it very volatile to trade commodities, right? Because you're, you get, you've got this supply issue You've got a huge shift. There's a lot to unpack here. Huge shift to green energy and other things. So, like, there's a huge demand for copper coming, all sorts of stuff. We're trying to retool the global system at the same time, but we're going to see demand destruction at points in this cycle. How do you navigate all of this? Actually, I think communities, it's actually quite simple because we need to have the demand destruction eventually. Uh, and we need it sooner than later. So, you need prices to go up. To, to bring that demand destruction. And again, it's not only price that will lead to the demand destruction. I think we get a demand destruction coming from financial crisis. You know, if you look, for example, like we had a recession in Europe from 2011 to 2014 uh, due to the, the European sovereign crisis, and crude oil averaged $111 a barrel for three and a half years, which is the equivalent of $150 today if you, you know, uh, take uh, global GDP deflator as, uh, you know, as inflation. Um, and the economy was still growing, right? And we still had more than a million barrels a day demand growth for oil. So actually, there's still a long way to go before we would have some kind of demand destruction, for oil at least. Um, and, at least and also for metals, when you think of it, energy, you know, is, uh, energy use is, is linked to, to economic growth, but also to population growth, which are obviously linked. Um, while now population growth is still, you know, still growing, we get a supply growth that is decelerating uh, and could actually go the other way due to the fear of climate change. You know, if you look at all the, the activists have been pushing the world to stop investing in fossil fuel, but not in finding alternative in terms of demand, right? So... The alternatives we think of is, you know, electric cars uh, uh, for for mobility, but you need um, a lot of minerals. You need a lot of metals to to build those batteries and EVs and to build enough uh, electricity, uh, renewable elect you know, generation. Um, and we don't have that, you know those metals. We won't have them over the next five to ten years. So actually, I'm not sure we would get much of a demand destruction for oil. Um, Given, given the fact that we won't have enough man minerals to, to actually drive that uh, e energy transition. So if anything, we actually stopped investing in fossil fuel um, production, and there's a bit of a lag, but now we are, we are, we are starting to, to feel the effect. Uh, we see in, in Africa, in, in um, Central Asia, that production is actually much lower than expectations. We see in the US that actually production is not following prices um, anymore. Um, and and the U.S. is a shorter cycle, right? So anywhere outside of the U.S., you speak about long lead time projects that are not going to come because it takes seven years in average between, you know, the green field being, you know, getting the green light and when the production comes. And nobody wants to invest, you know, for the next 20 years because we don't know what the demand will be. So we have a situation where for a few years, uh, for a you know, few years, meaning potentially five or more, we'll get a supply that's going to be very disappointing, potentially turning negative, where we'll get less supply than previous years. But the population growth is still positive. So you get more population and you'll get less supply of energy. And I think that's where the, the bottleneck will happen, right? We, we won't have enough energy and prices are going to go up and we will need to have this energy transition. Obviously, we need it for the climate. Um, but unfortunately, it's not going to come fast enough. The only you know good good story in it is that thanks to high prices that we'll we'll see over the next few years, we will have uh, an acceleration of the energy transition and you know investment in minerals and uh, and also you know slowdown in growth that will be eventually you know better for the climate than the alternative. 
So basically, it's, it's, it's actually a pretty simple story for commodities, uh, where we don't have enough of them and we won't have enough of them. Uh, and against that, we have a back, backdrop of you know, demand that wants to go up due to population growth. Um, and so that means that we will have to have recession along the way. But the recessions will be a result of not having enough commodities. So we should not really be too worried now of, I mean, for commodity prices, that a recession is going to come. Of course, it needs to come because you can't have demand, you know, oversupply for very long. Okay, yeah. So you get these periodic rebalances where demand goes down, but over time, we're in a, I guess you're saying we're in a secular super cycle again, much like we were when China came on the scene, because that was a, a massive global demand shock. Yeah, exactly. I think it's, it's quite similar. Uh, and when you think of what stopped the commodity rally then in 2008, it was a financial crisis, a full-blown financial crisis. It was not a recession, you know. Recessions like one, two percent, you know, economic decline is not enough to bring enough um, demand decline to, to bring commodity prices down, mainly with a backdrop of low supply growth. Um, and actually, what stopped communities uh, from making new all-time high after the recovery, so in 2010 and, and, and later, was the fact that U.S. production was, was a revolution of U.S. shale, right, that we didn't know about in 2008. So suddenly, U.S. production could, could grow two to two and a half million barrels a day per year, which was more than global demand growth, which was around one to 1.5 million barrels a day. And that's what uh, you know brought prices back down and kept the market for a while. So the only reason why, since 2014, we've been you know around 50, 60 dollars a barrel was only because we had at that price more supply growth in the U.S. and global demand growth. That's not the case anymore. Even at 100 dollars a barrel, we are not getting more supply growth from the U.S. than global demand growth. So. Uh, that's why we're here today. I don't think it's only due to, to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It's also due to the fact that uh, U.S. production is not growing as fast as in the past, and outside of the U.S., production is likely to decline. Yeah, because I guess the economic incentives are for people not to invest in capacity still, because there's less capital available, just because the kind of ESG mandates across many of the global asset allocators. So therefore, supply growth, which would have been faster in the past, is always going to be slower. You know, it's interesting because the very big picture backdrop is, is this is the rebalance to green, but you're going to have to take pain to go from here to there. Yeah, yeah, you'll have to take pain, but the thing is that it's not going to be as easy as we think as well due to the shortage of minerals uh, along the world. And also, you have, we have a very different geopolitical picture than in the past. You know, a lot of the, the minerals we need, and mainly the rare earths, minerals um, are in China. And, you know, if we carry on going to that path, uh, it's not a given that we will get all the minerals we need, you know, um, from China going forward. So how do you factor so, in the China equation? How are you thinking about it? Do you think there's a probability that we kind of try and isolate China, the world splinters? I mean, how are you thinking it through? I mean, it's all positive for commodities generally, but... Well, I think, you know, most of the risks are positive to commodities. That's why I think it's a simpler story than everything else. Uh, geopolitically, we can see that you know, uh, Russia is going in the wrong direction. Uh, they're, go they're going to the direction of North Korea. There's no easy way out. Um, you know, it's not like suddenly we'll have like a ceasefire and everybody's going to be friends with Putin and trust him. You know? um, before we reverse the sanctions, we being like the West, it's, um, you know, I think they will have to to be another regime, you know, in power in Russia and a, a friendly regime towards the West. So most of the sanctions will stay uh, after after this is over. Um, so I think already from Russia, I think we will have a declining amount of commodities to come over the next few years. And then, uh, you know, we have to, to follow what's going to happen with China. I mean, so far, they've been, you know, more on the Russian side than any, than, than, than the Western side, right? And the, for the last few years, their foreign policy has been more and more aggressive toward the West. And we are dependent on them. They are dependent on us as well. So, you know, I think for them, they don't have uh, an incentive to have an interest, I would say, in, in like a global financial crisis. I don't think it, it's their, in, their interest, but, you know, the Russian situation could, you know, show us that, you know, potential uh, 
uh, you know, China trying to squeeze the West at some point in the future is, is very possible. And we need to, to protect ourselves from that and to be less dependent on China in the future, mainly on strategic you know, commodities and, uh, and anything to do with um, you know, anything strategic, basically. Um, which means that we're going to have to bring some industries back to the West and uh, do some mining as well, you know, in the West, even if it's more expensive, to make sure we have our minerals. Um, but yeah, the world is actually very, very sensitive to the geopolitical situation and, and commodities in general. So, so that's why I think commodities is the simpler bet, right? You, it's, it's actually uh, always positive commodities, this kind of events. You've talked a few times, you've, you've dropped the word global financial crisis. Do you think that is the risk here? I mean, the, the financial crisis changed the backdrop for commodities last time around because China kind of changed its role and then we rolled into the EU crisis and we got stuck with lower demand for a period of time. Do you think we're going into a financial crisis because of what's going on? Because this is a tightening of financial conditions and people are going to blow up? I think we'll have to, I mean, it's hard to know the timing of it, but it's like kind of hard to have a, a soft landing when we get, you know, when there's so much geopolitical risk and supply risk in commodities. And when, even when everything's going well, we get the supply growth is going to be less than potential demand growth. So in general, um, the way I understand the world a little bit that, you know, um, it follows, you know, the financial market where we think everything's fine and things go up, everything looks fine until it's not, and then it gets worse and worse, and then we panic, and then it, and, and then it brings, you know, it brings us to a collapse. So it's hard to, you know, to get like some, just some like machine. It's actually a lot of things need to go right to just have a mild recession. So generally, the market gets, you know, stays bullish for too long. And we get you know, asset prices you know, disconnecting from reality, becoming way too high. And eventually you get a repricing and then a panic that brings us much lower. And then eventually, hopefully a recovery. But it's going to be unstable. I think you know, the kind of market moves we've had in commodities over the last few months, it's all, not only due to Russia, it's going to be uh, very volatile for a long time and eventually have an impact on, on equities as well. It's a really complicated world out there. We've got massive inflation recession fears, war in Europe, COVID, China issues. What the hell's happening? Everyone's got an opinion, but who's right, who's wrong? As co-founder of Real Vision, I've got my own view, but maybe I'm wrong too. And I want to go and find out more from real experts, real in-depth analysis. And I've hand-chosen my experts for this two-week journey of discovery in global recession. Is everyone wrong? I've chosen people like Peter Zihan to talk to him about geopolitics, David Rosenberg about the economy, and Pierre Andran, the world's most famous energy trader, about how to navigate the oil markets and where it's all going. This starts on May the 2nd, and I'm going to learn so much about what really is going on and how to best navigate it. Yes, not everybody's going to be saying the same thing, but it's going to allow me to piece together an investment framework to navigate these complicated times. Now, normally, we'd give you seven-day trial for $1, but because this is so important for all of you, and I think it's one of the most important pieces of content we've ever done, we're extending that free trial for two weeks for $1, so you get the entire campaign of all of these great minds, and it's only $1 for all of this. So just go to realvision.com forward slash global recession to find out more and join me as I try and figure out what the hell's going on. <laughs>